you might be aware that the Cancer Genome Atlas was uh, an effort by an NCI to collect uh, tissues from um, uh, tumor tissues and then do genomic analysis on those tumors and store all of that information. Did that, they did that for uh, over three dozen tumors for tens of thousands of patients. And the idea was to, or it still is, to mine that information, the multi-omic data that comes out of those tissue samples, and then to learn from that signatures that will allow you to predict, prevent, and then eventually cure uh, cancers. So that's what we do at uh, the Institute for Systems Biology, is we take very large amounts of data, different kinds of data, and we mine those data to find the signatures that are indicative of uh, both diagnostic and prognostic markers, and they're also informative regarding um, tailoring therapy for patients. But there are some considerations that one needs to make to be able to do this effectively, and I'll focus on that a little bit, uh, cover some conceptual uh, issues, and then give you an example a case study on glioblastoma as to how you can go from uh, tumor biopsy data from a patient cohort to making predictions of interventions that are tailored to the uh, to a given patient so the the basic uh, conceptual framework is that uh, we uh, just by you uh, making assays or doing assays on blood or urine and feces and different tissues you are able to then decipher a healthy state and differentiate it from a disease state, and do that in a quantitative way. So we, we can make all these measurements, plug that into some model, and that tells us what the status of the patient is. Now, quantitative assessment uh, based on these assays can be diagnostic, but to be predictive, you need to understand trajectory. So you need to understand how these signatures change over time. So as you're monitoring a patient uh, with their uh, annual or uh, biannual physicals, you're able to find signatures that might change in characteristic and predictive ways that will tell you that the risk for this patient to get uh, a tumor uh, in their brain or their, their spinal cord has increased. So you can start doing more aggressive monitoring on this patient. Now you can do this type of predictive uh, uh, diagnosis by uh, just looking at correlates. So you might see changes that appear in these different assays that are purely correlated but not necessarily causal for the disease. So having this type of knowledge does not necessarily help you find some interventions to, to prevent the disease from occurring or, or reversing a disease uh, if it does occur. So to do that, you need to really go from uh, correlation all the way to causation to mechanism. And let me stress on this a little bit more with, with some uh, generic examples because this is a point that is missed by, by many, even uh, the uh, leading scientists miss this point. So the idea here is you have a cohort of patients, and uh, given a large enough cohort, your expectation is that there are subgroups of, pay of patients here who share a similar dysfunction that is manifesting in a symptomatically similar way. And the challenge is to mine their data sets and find out who these patients are so you can subgroup them in a, in a data-driven fashion and then rank out of them based on the stage of progression or the subtype of disease. So you can then say these patients represent a pseudo-time scale of the disease progression. Now this is really important for diseases like glioblastoma where you really get only one biopsy per patient. It's not a disease where you can go in and sample repeatedly, especially when a patient is healthy. So for, for this reason, when we look into the TCGA, we have these uh, tissue samples from many different patients, hundreds, sometimes thousands. Our challenge is to treat them as if they were representations or reflections of, of similar diseases at different stages or similar subtypes of disease. And that assumption has to be supported with evidence, and that's, the, that's a big challenge. And I'll show you some ways we can do that. So, but here's the challenge. Now, when there's dysfunction in our systems, we are all complex systems, so we're made up of many genes, uh, 20, 30,000 genes, and these genes operate in the network. So they make proteins, the proteins interact in very complex ways and tissue-specific ways. And when there's dysfunction in one or a few genes, the consequence of the dysfunction can propagate throughout that network. So when you make a measurement, the changes that you observe are a reflection of changes that are both primary and secondary and tertiary. So you, it's a mixture of changes, not, not just the direct causal changes that you observe. And 
this is what you're left with. You have these very large data sets from which you need to find a needle that is predictive, that is mechanistically associated with the disease that you care about. And it's not easy. I mean, the, the, and we have uh, larger and larger data sets with many, many different types of information. So it becomes even harder as the technologies get more powerful to find this needle in a haystack. Now, let me give you examples of other data sets that are not as large, but that can mislead you. And here, when you look at a data set like this, you have genes with cryptic names. Um, so when you find an association between two features, now you, um, you might imply from that there's, there's, there's some functional association. And that's the general approach you take. So the idea is you see a change in one feature, and you correlate it with a change in another feature, and you say somehow these two are associated. And that's the general machine learning approach people take. But if you take that in a very naive way, these are the, the pitfalls, okay? Here are some data sets um, that you might understand. So these are correlations between uh, two features. People who drowned after falling out of their fishing boat correlates with marriage rate in Kentucky. Makes no sense at all. But look at the correlation, it's beautiful, right? Look at another correlation here. People who drown, sorry, uh, Age of Miss America correlates with murders by steam, hot vapors, and hot objects. And these data come from uh, CDC, and these are reputed data sources. And so when you have large enough data sets, uh, here's a third one. This is my favorite. It's per capita cheese consumption correlates with number of people who died by becoming entangled in their bed sheets. <laughs> It's, it's ridiculous, and you can tell it's ridiculous because we know what feature A really means and what feature B means. And when you find a correlation, you know there's no way these two can be correlated. But if, if I tell you feature one was NF1 and feature two was IRF1, no one would laugh because you don't know what NF1 is, you don't know what IRF1 does. And that's the type of challenge we face. And when you have tens of thousands of genes and modifications of their proteins and so forth, you can find associations by chance. So you can be misled. So that's the pitfall you have to really avoid. Uh, it, 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 and it is tempting. And it's, when you have large enough data sets, you'll see what you want to see. And you, you have to avoid that. So the, the challenge is to go from correlation to causation to mechanism. How do you do that? So let's uh, dive a little deeper. So, the idea is, let's say you had a biological system, okay, a cell line, for example, uh, and you expose that cell, that cell line to different perturbations. You change, you add some drugs, you change temperature, and each time you make measurements. You make measurements of how the gene expression changed, how protein interactions within the cell changed, and so forth. And you, you do that over a time course, over different doses of the perturbations, and so forth. And you collect a large amount of data. Now, the, the conceptual framework here is the response that you're observing is a consequence of some processing, information processing, that is being conducted by a network of, uh, of genes and proteins inside the cell. And the challenge we have at our hands is to figure out the topology of interactions that were responsible for giving that rise to that response. Okay, so that's why you treat that as a black box. And then you apply machine learning algorithms, taking into account biological principles of how these genes operate, how proteins bind DNA, how gene regulation is modulated, how metabolic functions uh, happen, and so forth. And you can inform the machine, the algorithm, to look for certain types of uh, topologies of interactions. And then you can cross-validate across different data sets for replication and so forth. And eventually, you come up with a network model that can explain how the inputs were processed into the outputs you observed. If you do this really well with uh, causation as a key parameter, meaning taking time sequence uh, of events into consideration, mechanism into consideration, and so forth, then that model can make predictions of new perturbations. So then you can say, if I take this cell line and I expose it to this new environment, then I would expect to see this response. And you can test that. So you need to do that iteratively and improve the model. You can do this with cell lines. How do you do it with human tissues? That's, that's a huge challenge. So you know, we've done this with systems where you can, with cell lines and so forth, where you can um, manipulate the systems in the laboratory, but then we wanted to know, can we apply it to uh, human systems? Um, but let me uh, cover some of the, the ideas of, once you have the data set, how do you, how do you start mining it? 
So we have algorithms, and I won't go into too much detail here, but just to give you a flavor of what, how these algorithms function. This is an algorithm that just goes through the data sets, many different kinds of data sets, looking for patterns that are supported across disparate types of information. And what we're looking for are genes that are behaving in a similar fashion, and their similar behaviors are supported by other sources of evidence, such as they function together, or they share some signatures in their DNA that imply that some protein is binding to these, these genes and controlling their behavior and so forth. And the likelihood of having evidence that supports a pattern across different types of information is very low. So you can calculate a statistical significance value for that. And if by chance it comes, the pattern arises because of some technological artifact, you can tell that very easily. So here's the algorithm. And what we're doing here is we're looking for patients that have, um, you can't see that, term, that have uh, genes that have similar expression patterns. So I'll just point out over here, so these are patients here, and we're looking at gene expression over there. And what we're looking for are genes that are behaving in a similar fashion or a subgroup of patients. And we're throwing out patients whose tissues did not have the genes behaving in a similar fashion. But that's not the only piece of evidence we're looking for in this particular discovery. We looked for some DNA sequence patterns that are supportive of some mechanism that explains why they behave together. We're looking for a functional association through evolution or metabolism and so forth. So by cross-validating across different pieces of evidence, we then say here's one signature which tells us that there's about 30 genes that behave in a similar fashion across these patients. And their similar behavior can be attributed to this mechanism they all share um, and this functional uh, associations they have in metabolism or in evolution. So once you have, and you can do thousands of such signature discoveries at the same time. So this algorithm can run on the cloud and you can parallelize it so you can do multiple discoveries at the same time. And that's where big data and cloud computing helps is you know that's not becoming a bottleneck anymore. So once you have <clears throat> such a module, we need to figure out what are the, the genetic and environmental factors that were responsible for that behavior we observed across those patients. And there's many algorithms that you can apply. Classically, what people do, and we've done in this in the past as well, you apply regression-based approaches. So that's the correlative-based approach I described earlier. But this is a little more sophisticated, where you take into account time lag between change in an environmental factor and the consequence of that on expression of genes. And you can derive models like this, which is each arrow here is a mathematical equation that describes how change in oxygen predicts the change in expression of genes in the cluster, change in some gene or change in some gene in the presence of light or absence of light. And collectively, we can write a summative equation here that describes the influence of all these factors on genes in this signature. Okay? This is a predictive model. So we can take measurements of just those four predictors, oxygen, the two proteins, and, the, and light. And you can take those measurements, plug it into the model, and say these genes would behave in this manner in these patients. And then you can go and make those actual measurements and evaluate whether your model made an accurate prediction. Okay? So we've shown that when you have a model like this, we've published papers on this to show that you can make predictions of behaviors of genes across the entire genome of, of simple to very complex systems. But this really gets regression-based approaches can be misleading, especially in complex uh, eukaryotic systems like us, where you can have the control systems lying very far away from the genes. And the chromatin structure, modifications, all of these play into how the genes can be modulated. So we've developed other algorithms. Again, very quickly, we can look at um, new technologies which allow you to monitor the structure of the chromatin in our cells and tell you whether the chromatin was accessible or not accessible, and whether there was evidence if a protein was bound in a particular location. And in this case, for example, we had this sequence, CACGTG, which is a small little recognition sequence for this important transcription factor called USF1. And if you look across the three billion bases of the human genome, you can find the short sequence occurring many, many times. Not all of those matches are really functional because many of those sites are not in the right context or they're not located in the region that is accessible and so forth. But we can now look through this accessibility information and say of the three sites, two were accessible. And because they're accessible, you have those two peaks. And of the two sites, the one in the middle has evidence that a protein was bound there. 
So by wading through these reams of information, we can find out specifically in the human genome, six billion base pairs, where exactly this transcription factor would bind and be functionally um, uh, effective. And we can do this for thousands of transcription factors. So we can take all these signatures that we got from these patients and then start mapping this, these wires onto these modules to say this transcription factor bound to the DNA of these genes and then change the expression of these genes. So we can get really, really accurate models by doing this. I'll skip that. We can do the same for microRNAs, which are these small RNA molecules that can control genes after they have been transcribed from DNA into mRNA. And these small RNA molecules can go and bind to the three prime untranslated region of the transcripts and control the stability of RNA. So we can use a hidden Markov model to then so scan these uh, uh, three prime UTRs, as they're called, of these uh, genes, and then find exactly where you have a conserved sequence. And by using HMM, we can then find out what was the RNA, microRNA, that was responsible for controlling it. So there's many such algorithms that we can put together into this framework we call, I'll skip this, we call the signal pipeline. It stands for, for the uh, Systems Genetics Network Analysis Pipeline. And this pipeline is a very generalizable pipeline that we apply to glioblastoma, which I will cover in the next 10 minutes or so. And you can plug into this these data sets from patient cohorts, uh, and RNA expression data, the interaction information, modification information, and so forth. And out pops a network from that, which tells you how mutations within tumors of each patient impinge upon these networks that we've discovered to modulate the cancer phenotypes, okay? And this really tells us uniquely how every patient differs from another patient based on the mutational landscape of their tumors. And so in glioblastoma, I'll cover, uh, go over this very quickly. Here's one signature example, okay? So we took 422 patients, and then we took their tissues, uh, ran all these sequencing and... Uh, uh, mapping uh, uh, technologies on them, generated very large data sets, ran this pipeline on it, and we got uh, about 1,800 signatures, of which about 500 were associated with disease. This is one of those signatures. And what you have here on the x-axis are patients. On the y-axis, we have gene expression levels. And we have rank ordered the patients based on 16 genes and how they were expressed within these patients' tumors. So the 16 genes are changing in a coherent fashion across about 400 patients, but there's about 20 odd patients on which the, the variation was too large, so we excluded those patients. And we rank ordered the patients based on the median value of the gene expression of these 16 genes. And then we painted these uh, each bar here is a patient. We painted each patient based on the diagnosis um, that was done on the tissue. And then and this includes normal brain. You have the five different classes of uh, glioblastomas. You have a G-SIM pro neural, neural classical, and mesenchymal. And then we can ask, can we see any enrichment of these diagnoses done in a classical sense when compared to the signature. And you begin to see that most of the tissues that were classified as normal fall into the lowermost quintile. Whereas as you go, as the expression values go up, you have the mesenchymal subtype enriched. So if this signature were discovered and, and you could find the value to be high, you can tell the patient is more likely to have mesenchymal. But you can see that there are some missed calls. And you can ask this, whether this missed call is because the diagnosis was wrong or if the signature is incorrect. And it's most likely the diagnosis was wrong. Okay, so we can take an independent uh, evaluation. We can ask if we take patients from the lower fifth of this group and compare them to the upper fifth, or as quintiles as they're called, do we see difference in clinical outcomes like survival? And so we can convert the scale into a survival scale. And it shows that patients in whom the gene expression values were low tend to survive longer than patients where the expression of these genes is high. Okay. We can look at these genes and check to see if they're secreted and whether they cross a blood-brain barrier and appear in blood. And that's your biomarker that you can then use to then track patients. Once you, see, you detect that a patient has been diagnosed, you can start monitoring the patients with signatures like this one. 
And we can then plug all these 500 odd disease relevant signatures into our pipeline and find um, the flow of information as I described earlier. So we can take mutations in the patient. We can ask what mutations can we find that map into the networks associated with hallmarks of cancer. And you have about 10 hallmarks of cancer, apoptosis, uh, uh, evasion of apoptosis, or proliferation, angiogenesis, and so forth. And this gives you a map that you can use to then tailor therapy. And the way you can do that is by looking at the entire network. And, and as you can see, it's a very complicated network, which can tell you how the mutations are changing many different aspects of this, uh, the, the cancer networks, and controlling many different kinds of hallmarks. And there's many different kinds of ways you can use this network, and I'll show you a couple. So there's one prediction the network made, and it said that patients who have a, a mutation in NF1 or PIK3CA, these two genes, if they have these mutations, then those mutations will impact this gene called IRF1, and the expression of this gene will go up. And when the expression of this gene goes up, that gene is predicted to encode a protein that then controls a cluster of genes we call P.282, and these, this cluster of genes is involved in lymphocyte infiltration into tumors. Okay. That's the type of information you can derive from these models. And as you saw, there's many different kinds of hypotheses you can derive. But then we have to go and start evaluating, is there evidence to support this hypothesis? And for each of these predictions, we can then look, for example, we can look whether patients who have mutations do indeed have high IRF1 levels for this particular gene, IR, uh, for the expression of that gene, versus patients who don't have the mutations. And in a similar fashion, we can validate each connection across this flow of information. And once you do that, you can then say, okay, now let's look at the phenotypic evidence. And the genes in that cluster, P.282, are predicted to be involved in a process called uh, MHC class one antigen processing. And this is an immunomodulatory process. And what you would predict is if you modulate this process, you would change lymphocyte infiltration into tumors. So we went and checked, and indeed, when patients had mutations of the, in those two genes, the lymphocyte infiltration was much higher in their tumors. So we can then use this type of information to then rank prioritize patients for immunotherapy. In this case, what we find counterintuitively is that when you have the mutations, responsiveness to immunotherapy is worse in those patients. We can also use drug intervention. So we can say, okay, if you block this particular network using a drug or using a gene therapy, we could reverse or prevent the trajectory that we're observing. Okay, because we know that this network is associated with some hallmark of cancer. And as I said, you can cherry pick hypotheses and do those validations to get a paper, uh, to publish a paper. But in reality, what you want to do is be very unbiased because when the networks are really large, you have to be as unbiased as possible. So we did what is called a CRISPR-Cas screen, and you might have heard of CRISPR technology where you can use that to, rem to edit the genome um, in a very precise way. So we took a library of these CRISPR-Cas reagents and knocked out about a thousand transcription factors, which are regulatory genes in the human genome. And then we asked which of those knockouts had an effect on proliferation of uh, both uh, glioblastoma-derived cells and normal neuronal cells. And did the network accurately predict which of those transcription factors would have an effect on proliferation? And this is a summary. I won't go into any details, but we showed that the network had made accurate discoveries of what was known and new predictions of what transcription or genetic interventions would reverse proliferation. Um, I'll skip this. So this is how we can use the network model. So when a new patient comes in, we can do multi-omic profiling on that patient. And using the multi-omic profiling, we can map the patient onto trajectories. And based on their position in the trajectories, we can now begin to predict what the clinical outcome might be. And that really depends on what information we have. For example, if we had information on responsiveness to chemotherapy, then we could say the patients in the upper quintile responded to these drugs, but not these drugs. So the likelihood of this new patient to respond this, to this sort of drugs is higher than to these other uh, type of drugs. 
uh, we can um, then predict clinical outcome. And with knowledge of where the signature falls in the network, we can uh, also make predictions of new drug targets and new combinations that would be effective with that patient. And we can run assays. This, this would be the future where you can take the patient-derived glioma-like stem, uh, stem-like cells and run these drug screens. And this is the true N of one experiments where you are tailoring therapy based on the network dysfunction of a patient and you're running screens with tissue derived from that patient and you're doing it in an accelerated fashion, in a rational fashion, where you're taking the tissues and combining drugs that you predict will be uniquely uh, tailored to that patient's tissue. And here it shows that you can, you can do that, you can get the uh, I see 50 curves for these agents, combine them, and you get synergy. Of course, these have been all done in cell lines. We're now looking to do it in uh, patient-derived cells in collaboration with the Swedish Cancer Institute here. And we're also partnering with the Seattle Children's Institute to figure out why patients who responded to immunotherapy came back with recurrence. And what we've discovered there is that the, the patients who responded to CAR T-cell therapy against uh, IRF, uh, sorry, IL-13 receptor alpha-2 came back with tumors where the expression of that receptor had gone down. So now we map those patients into the network, and we can predict that there's a specific mutation in a gene that might be responsible for the downregulation of this receptor, and that is why these cells have escaped immunotherapy. So the, the idea here is to take a drug that specifically inhibits that network so you can reinduce the expression of this particular receptor to make the cells uh, more responsive to immunotherapy. Uh, so this, uh, this was published last year. So this is very early stage, but the, the hints of what is possible is becoming more and more lucrative nowadays because of the, the capabilities of our mining algorithms and also the capabilities of running these assays in high throughput. Um, we're at a stage where we can run these screens in a very targeted fashion, uh, and we have setups here at Swedish that can do high-throughput drug screens uh, using the patient-derived cells. And, and just as a uh, side note, this approach is not just unique to glioblastoma. We are, we're applying it to multiple myeloma, we're applying it to mesothelioma, and many of uh, different diseases. This here uh, was an application of the approach to tuberculosis, where FDA, for the first time in 40 years, had approved a drug, and we saw that TB was resisting killing by the drug. It was tolerating it for the first 10 days, and that's a long enough window where you can have issues with resistance being um, uh, an issue. So we wanted to figure out how TB was doing it, so we ran the pipeline um, on the response of TB to the drug and figured out that when, when TB saw the drug, it was inducing a network that was resisting the drug. So it took a second drug and hit the tolerance network, made it dysfunctional, and the pathogen became more susceptible to the drug. So this is just a summary to show that you can, you can take these multiomics data and build predictive models. In the, in, originally, it was thought that once you have the genome sequence, you would figure out what what the cause of diseases are, but it was very quickly obvious that it's not that simple. And then people thought if you look at the expression of genes and the expression of proteins and so forth, you would be able to do that, and that didn't turn out very well. And now we're at a stage where we're building mathematical models using all the data to make predictions. And this is showing some real signs of success. So we can then bring this type of an alg- uh, a pipeline into the clinic so we can have a quick turnaround time where patients come in, you do these high throughput analysis, plug it in, into these models, and then tailor therapy, right? So I'll stop there.